morning, everyone. So glad to see you. You may be seated. God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. We can say amen to that, right? Psalm 33, Psalm 33 reminds us of this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, Let, even as we hope in you. That's good words today. Know that your hope is not in a person or in a group of people or a bank account or your strength or your rugged good looks, okay? Our hope is in the Lord who keeps his promise to thousands of generations, amen? So remember to renew your hope in the Lord as we do that today on this Palm Sunday, amen? Okay, so again, so great to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us online from various places. Welcome to all of you uh, in various places in this building as well. At this point, the kids in this room or in the rooms are free to go down to Children's Church right back over there. See you guys. Thanks again for helping us. Why don't we clap for the kids? Thank you for helping us this morning celebrate Palm Sunday. Kids are a joy, aren't they? They are a joy. We are privileged to partner with parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles in raising their kids in the Lord and in the house of the Lord. So it's a beautiful thing. By the way, if you didn't notice, uh, if you haven't met this, uh, I want to say young man, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Mario is here with us. He hasn't been with us for uh, over a year. So... He is now free to roam about the country, and he's been chomping, chomping at the bit to be back in service. So welcome to you, Mario, and welcome to those of you who are visiting from various places or here checking us out, perhaps the first or second time. Greetings to you as well. Okay, I'm going to hit a few things before we jump into the Word. So number one, what's happening this Friday? Does anyone, does anyone know what's happening? Good Friday. Good Friday is happening this Friday, followed by what's on Sunday, next Sunday? You guys have done this before, haven't you? You've done this before. Okay, so Good Friday service. We're going to have our first cross point Good Friday service on Friday, of course, 7 p.m. So if you can make it out, I think it's going to be a powerful, meaningful service for you. We are going to stream it as well for those of you uh, who are unable to come here. That's happening this Friday. Please mark it down, 7 o'clock in this building. Now, I'm also going to look to re recruit men for our men's retreat, okay? This is coming up on April 10th. I am going. There's a few people that are going. And guys, I'm encouraging you. I know it's a Saturday. I know it's $55. I know it's all day. But listen. This is a great time to be encouraged in your faith. This is a great time to connect with other guys, okay? So we have a two-hour ride. Okay. And so, but that's a good way to interconnect. So we are looking for ways to continue to integrate, and this is a great way to integrate. So if you're kind of on the fence or you're not even considering it, I want you to consider it. And you say, well, I can't afford the money. We will help you with that. And if you say, well, I can't afford the time, I'm going to encourage you to make time in your time budget to be able to participate. So that's happening. Please sign up in the back. If you have any questions, Fred, raise your hand back here. Fred, there he goes, right there. There's Fred, so you can ask him. He knows the details, so please um, consider signing up and love to join with you that day. Okay, so another thing we're recruiting for, we are looking for a new children's director, okay? And so we are looking for someone to come in and be the next children's director here at Cross Point. So I'm asking you for help. So if you know someone who may qualify for this, if you're interested yourself, 
please contact the church office. We'll send you job descriptions and we'll connect with that person or yourself. So we are looking for this person. And if you know somebody, um, please send them our way. And if it's you, please come our way and uh, please be praying for that as well. So that is an ongoing search that we are launching in a very public way this morning. Okay, another thing that's going to be happening every Sunday, we just, by the way, had our first shepherds meeting uh, yesterday, and the first thing we did, our first order of business was to pray, okay? We're going to pray. Out of our meeting, uh, we talked about having a prayer meeting on Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. in the prayer room, which is right over here. Probably the most beautiful room in this entire building. So 9 a.m., it's an open prayer for whomever, 9 to 9.30 or 9.45. You can come when you get here, and we are praying for the service. That's what we are praying for. This isn't our regularly scheduled prayer meeting, but this is the time to pray before the service excuse me, to prepare our hearts and to ask God to uh, meet us here in the morning. So you are all invited to join in prayer 9 a.m. on Sundays in the prayer room. And by the way, uh, Pastor Key made out a prayer request list for the country of Myanmar. If you've been paying attention, uh, there was uh, lots of violence that took place yesterday. And 114, I believe, was killed. Do you have any other updates? I think it was 114 or more. There was a ton of activity that is happening. And so we can reach there by praying. We can reach there by giving. So in the back, on the welcome counter in the back, there is a sheet there, a color sheet with prayer requests for, from Pastor Key saying, please pray for this, 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 and this, and this. So if you would grab one on the way out, and that way you can put it wherever you're praying or wherever you see it, um, to pray for the country of Myanmar and what's taking place there. Uh, on a, another note, um, Lois Dixon, I don't think the Dixons are here. They are not here. Okay, so this, this is a very sad thing. Um, uh, Lois and Paul Dixon have been a part of Mosaic, and she runs, um, she runs Hallstrom, and, and those in Temple know all about Hallstrom. She started that. They're instrumental in the Pregnancy Care Center starting that. Just last week, it was confirmed that she has stage four uh, pancreatic cancer that has already affected her liver, and um, so they are asking for prayer for that. She's going to be starting chemo uh, this week, and we know the, the Dixons far and wide, and a lot of people know them. And so if you can remember to pray for her, pray for their family, and as they are uh, trusting in the Lord and, and Lois, they're at, they're at peace. They're saying, you know what? Uh, we lived, and we're going to continue to live. And boy, talk about uh, people who have made an impact for the kingdom in Rockford. And so if you would pray for Lois, if you pray for Paul, if you pray for the Dixon family, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Lastly, uh, <laughs> Mr. Brandon Malam here is taking pictures. So he's here in the front. So if you see a guy with a camera, that's Brandon. He's here. He's not from the newspaper, okay? So he's here taking photos. And he's going to help us uh, with website pictures. And, you know, on Sundays, we'll hope to have some pictures up and Facebook stuff. So he's taking pictures, and we're thankful that he's helping us with that gift. Okay. So that's it for my announcements. There is a lot. So everyone here, in one way or another, needs some encouragement and hope, okay? Everyone here, you are some, in some way battling or facing something. I know that because I'm a human as well, okay? We all face things that we need some encouragement, we need some strength, and we need some hope. We're all facing a difficulty in one form or another. Here's good news for you. This is Romans chapter 15, verse 4. This is not the text for the day, but I'm bringing it to us to remember what Scripture is written for. And this is what it's written. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope, right? Do you like that? So the Old Testament, the New Testament was written to teach us. That's why we focus on and speak from Scripture. Scripture was given to teach us so that through endurance it will help us endure and the encouragement of Scripture, we may have 
hope, right? That's good news. And so when we talk, we teach from the scripture that we can have strength and encouragement, that our hope would be alive and robust so that we can continue to endure until we see Christ face to face, right? Until we are safely home. So when you read scripture and when I speak and we speak from scripture, it's given to teach us. So say, God, teach my heart. It's given to encourage us. It's given to strengthen us. It's given that we may have hope to continue to walk forward in the faith. So this morning, we're focusing on a passage where Jesus enters into Jerusalem for his final week leading up to his crucifixion, which is Good Friday, and his resurrection, which is Easter. We are, of course, focusing in on that passage so that we will be encouraged, so that our hope will be strengthened. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, the Old Testament prepares the people of God for the Messiah, the Redeemer, to come. All the way from the opening pages of Genesis, talking about the one who will crush the head of the serpent. And all throughout the Old Testament, who is this um, serpent crusher? Who will be the great redeemer? And God gives his prophecies. He gives his promises. He gives his um, interaction with his people. And on the right time, there was a star in Bethlehem, right? Exactly the right time time as they waited between the prophets and the coming of this Messiah, the one who was to redeem them. And so Jesus appeared miraculously, just like was prophesied. He was born to Mary and with Joseph, not in a palace, not in a, not in a grandiose place, but in a small town, in a manger, as we know. And this child grew up, and he started to minister around 30 or so. And he talked about the kingdom of God, right? And John the Baptist came before him, and we know John, right? To prepare the way of the Lord. Talking to people and preparing the hearts of the people around that place and repentance to open their hearts to receive the Christ. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, it says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus walked around the countryside proclaiming the word of God because John tells us that it was the word incarnate. The word became flesh. And he did miracles from town to town. Things that, that no one had seen, like the eyes of the blind being opened like demons being um, exercised, taken out of people, like providing food miraculously, like calming storms by a word, even raising the dead. Now the crowds of people followed this man. They were wondering, who is this? Could this be the Messiah? And the religious authorities came and tried to check him out. Well, we have to see what's up, if this guy is legit or not. Some of them had hearts that were open to receive. And they recognized who this was. He indeed is the Messiah. Whereas others said, no, he's a fraud. He's a fake. It's blasphemy that he's speaking to death with him. Everywhere Jesus went, crowds followed. He became the most popular and sought-after individual of his time. People followed him to everywhere and every place. But Jesus knew what he had come to do, to redeem his people from their sins. And so during and approaching the last week of his ministry, we call it, this is called Holy Week because this is where Jesus was in Jerusalem. We see his final teachings. We see the scenes of him with the disciples at the Good Supper, of course, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. And as Jesus was getting close to the city, there were all of these people. Lazarus, he just raised from the dead. He was out in a suburb of Jerusalem called Bethany and Bethpage. He was there. And all of these things were leading up to the holy feast. 
And so what is recorded for us is recorded in all four Gospels. We're going to look at that passage. And then we're going to look at the passage in which Jesus was fulfilling. And just a heads up, he fulfilled half of the prophecy. Okay? And we're going to look not only what Jesus fulfilled so that we may have hope in him, but what he promises to do with anticipation for the future. We're going to look at that passage this morning as we look to the New Testament and then to the Old. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to look at Matthew's account of what took place. Okay? Now remember, the crowds are there. There's anticipation. Is he going to be the Messiah? Is he going to come in as a conquering king? Or, or some are saying, I hope he doesn't come. And others are saying, Hosanna. Okay? All of this heightened anticipation where everyone was trying to figure out who this person was. Who is he? Is he a fraud? Is he the Messiah? Is he a prophet? Who is this man? So here we go, Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, that's right outside of Jerusalem, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Now go to the village ahead of you, and at once... You will find a donkey tied there, and her colt by her. Untie them, and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, this took place to fulfill. Okay, Jesus was saying something very, very important in this act. What was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, that's God's people, see your king comes to you. Gentle. And riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their coats on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their coats on the road, while others cut branches from trees, here we go, and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, to the Son of of David. Significant that they recognize this connection, that he was literally a child of David, which is important because there was a promise to David that said that from you will come the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked this important question. Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The whole city being stirred, right? Asking the question, who is this? And that is a question and each and every one of us needs to answer. You know about Jesus, but who is he really? Is he who he claimed to be, the son of God? God, the Redeemer, the Messiah, or is he someone else like a good moral teacher or perhaps a prophet or even perhaps a fraud? That is the most significant question you and I nor anyone or anyone can answer. Who is this man? Now, it seems pretty peculiar that Jesus would enter into the city riding a donkey. Right? And he was very, very specific about this request. Hey guys, go ahead of me, you're going to find a donkey. Right? He knew what was going to happen. He knew the scripture. Bring him me, and I'm going to enter that way. Not in a war horse, not striding in a donkey. Why? To fulfill a prophecy from the Old Testament. And if people knew their Old Testament, if people knew their scripture, and if they were looking for the Messiah, they would remember this passage 
from Zechariah that said, The king will come in. Rejoice, O sons, daughters of Zion. Rejoice, God's people. And specifically, those in Jerusalem shout. Okay? And if they knew that this king was going to the Messiah, enter into the city on a donkey. When they see, saw Jesus riding a donkey, they would have said, Whoa, I know about this. I have been waiting for this. So Jesus, not verbally saying he was a Messiah at this point, was saying that he was a Messiah by what he did. Here I am. It is me, your king. So we're going to talk about this passage. And if you have a Bible, go to uh, Zechariah, okay? Go over there. It's in the Old Testament. It's near the end of the Old Testament. Okay? It's Zechariah, and then it's um, Malachi, right? It's right there, right before the New Testament. And so what Jesus was doing is fulfilling um, this question about who is this person? And I'm again, I'm going to give you some foreshadow that this passage talks about two things, two-part prophecy. One, what Christ did. Okay? And we are looking back to that, or they were looking forward to it. Okay? We're looking back to the first part, which was fulfilled. And then we, as they, are now continuing to look forward to the second part, which will be fulfilled. So here is the exact words of Zechariah chapter 9, starting with verse 9. And I'm going to take the first verse, we're going to talk about it, and then we're going to look to what comes next, what we're anticipating. So here we go, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly. Okay, sound familiar? It should. O daughter of Zion, the children of God, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, specifically, he is coming. See. Your king comes to you. He is righteous and having salvation. Gentle, sound familiar? And riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, again, Zechariah is one of the last books of the Old Testament. It was written about 500 to 600 years before the time of Christ, before the Messiah showed up. This passage, of course, is a messianic passage that points to and prepares the people for the coming of the Messiah. So when Jesus did, he was entering again into the city. He was fulfilling this prophecy, pointing all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 of the person who would crush the head of the snake. And the people were to, because of his appearing, rejoice and know specifically in the city to give a shout. And they were looking forward to this event. And it happened just as it was prophesied to do so. So that they, and so that we, can be encouraged and have hope. So let's take a look at this passage. This is for us to do, to remember who Jesus is. That's the, the first point here. To remember who Jesus is. So this will help you. This will give you encouragement and this will renew your hope. So I want us to remember who Jesus is. We're taking it right from this passage. Number one, he is the king. Here he is. He is the king. Your king, which means that he has the right to rule, which means he has all power, which means he is the one to be obeyed, which means that he is the embodiment of the law, which means he is a king, and we as his people um, have a response to honor him, to know him, to follow him, to obey him. Not only is he a king, do you notice it didn't say here it comes a king? It says here comes the king. Right? This is a king 
who is over all kings, whoever were, who are now, and whoever will be. His authority is greater than any president. His authority is greater than any general. His authority is greater than any earthly king or monarchy. He is above all of those things in all kings and all people and all places and all times will bow a knee to him. Okay. That's a significant statement. I want you to remember who this person is, Jesus. He is a king. Not only is he a king, he's the king. Right? This is our sovereign Lord. This is the one we celebrate riding on a donkey, which points to who he is and his identity. He is the king. See, your king comes to you. So second, he is the initiator. He comes to us. Right? Psalm 15 talks about who can ascend to your holy hill? Who can be with you on Mount Zion? It goes on to describe someone who has a um, clean hands and a pure heart. It goes on to, side to, to describe someone who is faultless, someone who is pure. And un, the unfortunate truth is that none of us are qualified to be on that hill. So he comes to us. Right? He redeems us. Us. He makes us new. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He initiates us to us at just the right time while we were sinners. Christ died for us. He came to his own. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Are not you grateful that Christ came for you? Came for you! He just wasn't up there on the holy hill saying, well, I don't know if they'll make it. I hope they find their way as we are blind guides guiding those who are blind. Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the door, the way, the truth, the life came to you. We have hope in a king that is the king. We have hope because he comes to us. He meets us where we are. He meets your neighbor where he is and meets your daughter where she is. He comes to us. Not a passive king waiting for us to pay him homage. This is the king who take, took off his robe, who came to us in our house, in our village, in our sin find us. He comes to seek and to save the lost. Don't you like that about Jesus, right? This should give you hope. Remember who Jesus is. He is the king. He is the initiator. He is the righteous one, right? From this passage, here he is, righteous. In him there is no sin, 1 John 3, 5. In him there is no no flaw, Psalm 15. In him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1, 5. He is the righteous one. Acts 7, 52. You want the one who has all sovereignty and all authority and all power to be righteous. You don't want the one who has all power and authority to be mostly good, but a little bit bad. You don't want that. Mostly light, but a little bit shadow. What if 
the God who had all authority and power had a bad day. Forget them all. Beep. Jesus, who is God incarnate, is completely righteous. Righteous. This should give you hope. Hope. Not only is he powerful, not only is he loving to initiate with us, he is good. He is for you, not against you. He is righteous, pure, holy, good. To give you hope. He is also the Redeemer. The prophecy said he comes to you riding on a donkey, righteous, having or bringing salvation. He is the Redeemer. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, John the Baptist. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we may become the righteousness of God. Don't you like that? Now Jesus, the king of kings, didn't have to come to the earth, but he did. Jesus, the king of kings, who lived perfectly, he could have just walked through this earth as a human, never sinning, and then he could have died and went into heaven on his own merit. The only one. And he could have left all us suckers behind. Right? He would have been good. I'm all good. Right? He could have said that. But God in his goodness made him who knew no sin become sin for us. That we may become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't leave us behind. But he took on the penalty of our unrighteousness, on our unperfection, for our sin and our slavery to it. Went through what we recognize on Good Friday. He is our, let's make it personalized, he is your Redeemer. He just didn't come in his own Righteousness to show you who he was and how great he was. He gave his life for us, bringing with him salvation. Lastly, on this section, he is gentle. Gentle. Now you may say, that's a weird attribute. Most people with power are not gentle. Our sinful humanity is corrupted. And often when we see people getting some power, and over time they typically tend to abuse it. And we do do this in our flesh. But this king is different. He is gentle. Why is this important? And I love this passage in Matthew chapter 12. should have the verses here for you. Behold. Let me go to the next slide, please. Behold, my servant whom I have choose, chosen. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not quench. Until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. At one time or the other, I bet you were your faith was a smoldering flame, right? It's there, but barely. Jesus doesn't come out over and say, Phew. There are times in which you were a bruised reed, right? You were battered up by either sin that has been um, done to you by others, or destructive behaviors that you willfully participated in. The gentle Savior doesn't say, well, forget that. I'm only looking for perfect people. 
you glad that God doesn't look for perfect people? <laughs> oh. Maybe you would be here, but I sure wouldn't. None of us would be here. So this gentle Savior, when he sees someone who is bruised and beat up, strengthens and encourages and brings the health, when he sees a faith that is just barely there, smoldering, doesn't ignore it or blow it out, he fans it to flame. Knowing who Jesus is should give you hope. Knowing what Jesus has done should give you hope. Be encouraged you serve a great king. Be encouraged you serve a righteous king. Be encouraged that he sees you and comes to you. Be encouraged that this all powerful God is gentle. This is good news. Now we're going to turn the corner. So we see it from this vantage point between the resurrection and the ascension and his second coming. We live between these two events. We look back to what he did, which gives us encouragement, which gives us faith, which gives us hope, which gives us understanding who he is. And we look back with thankfulness in our heart. And now I want to bring you to the second part of this prophecy, in which we are looking forward as we're standing as prisoners of hope during this time in which our faith is built upon the rock of Jesus in which our hope is embodied and captured by the promise of Jesus of what is yet to come. I want you to hear the next verse of the promise and the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. This king riding on a donkey who is righteous, having salvation. Hosanna, he comes to you. And then it turns to first person, as if Jesus were speaking, and says this in verse 10. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. And the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to shining sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant, sound familiar, right? With you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless Return to your fortress, O oh, prisoners of hope. Even now, I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. So let's talk about this for a bit. We have hope in what Jesus has done, and remember that, be encouraged. By who you serve, who is with you, whose spirit resides in your heart. Be encouraged, have hope, gain strength, endure. And then look forward and anticipate what Jesus will do. He says he will create peace between the nations. Do all nations on this planet get along well? Has there ever been wars on the earth? Do these things happen? They're continual. They are grievous. They are 
in some cases, demonic. And it seems like our planet has never been at peace. Always this country against that country, that country against this country, this country trying to undermine that country. It is a continual, constant, global battle all the time. And when the king comes, take away the elements of war, the tanks, the bombs, the guns, the knives, items for destruction, he will take them away. He will break them. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Your heart is broken by the, the, the brokenness of our world and the continual news feed of another power taking advantage of another place. Have hope. It's not always going to be this way. There is a king who is coming and he will proclaim peace to the nations. We have that to look forward to. And anticipates that day with longing as a prisoner of hope. Anticipate that he will create peace between the nations. It is prophesied. It is promised. It continues. His rule will extend from sea to sea. And from the river to the ends of of the earth. There's going to be no pocket of insurrection remaining on this planet when the king comes. Right? All nations, all people will recognize this great creator, sovereign king. His rule will extend over the entire new creation from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now what river is he talking about? I'm going to suggest the river is the one we read about in Revelation. The river of life that flows from the very throne of God, which has a tree that brings healing to the nations, that makes the people glad. He will reign as earth and heaven are together, and He will be sovereign over it all. This is a good and sought-after future reality that was promised by the one who always keeps his promises. This is the hope we have, that he will rule over all creation. Even now, creation longs and groans for it. Longs for the redemption. Every time we see brokenness and we see abandonment and we see abuse, and those of us who are prisoners of hope, we weep, we look for restoration, and we hold on to it. It won't always be this way. We wait for this king. He will rule over all creation. He will create peace between the nations. He will free people from the penalty of sin. Don't you like that? Right? As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, with those in whom believe in me, and those in whom I covenant with, I will free you as prisoners from the waterless pit, that is from hell. If you're in Christ, right, he will 
free you from the punishment of your sin because he took it upon himself. Good news. Salvation is an already, not yet. We have it already, but we not have it yet in its fulfillment, in its fullness. But that day is coming, right? And this should give you hope in which the day you take your last breath here and you take your first breath there. You don't have to fear. Not because of your goodness, but because of His goodness. Hope gives us strength, which gives us courage, which gives us encouragement, which helps us to endure this life, which at times is brutal, which at times is difficult, which at times is overwhelming. Take courage, have hope, the King is coming. He will free people from the penalty of sin because the blood of His covenant, which all the Old Testament pointed to Christ, the Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world, the one we read about in Revelation and we look forward to with anticipation and longing. He will free you, O prisoners, from the waterless pit. And I like what he said, verse 12, right? <laughs> Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Don't you like that? If you're going to be a prisoner, be a prisoner of hope. You, my people, come to me. Hang on to this hope. I will restore far more than what you lost. I will announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I'm going to give you far more than what was lost. That's good news. Those who have been persecuted and suffered and fleed from countries, God's going to restore more than what you lost. Those who have lost limb, those who have lost life, God will give you more than what was lost. Those who have had to to separate from family and friends and places that you love, God will give you more than what you've lost. Those who have suffered, those who have given, those who have gone, those who have sacrificed, (laughs) I announce that I restore twice as much to you more than you have lost. That should give you hope. It will be worth it in the end. Continue to love, continue to embrace, continue to give, continue to follow the King of all kings. Built upon what He did, but also what He will do. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through Him and for Him. For He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, which is the church. He is the beginning, firstborn from the dead. He is everything, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And he says To you today, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning 
and the end. We say, man, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. I have talked to many people who have been in prison and none of them want to go back. But here is God telling us, you and I have been captured by the grace of God and the love of God and the goodness of God. Return to your safe place. Return to that good promise. O prisoner of hope. I think that would make a good t-shirt. Prisoner of hope. Whoever makes t-shirts, make me one. Maybe we'll make a bunch of them. What do you mean, prisoner of hope? Well, let me tell you. I think that's a good t-shirt. I'm not kidding. So I want you to be captured by hope. (laughs) Captured by hope. And the Son of God who fulfills the prophecies and will fulfill His promise. Return to hope. And if you're running outside somewhere and or you're captured by something other than hope, be freed, my friend, and be recaptured by hope. He is our fortress. He is our defense against all troubles and the storms of life. And the storms blow. Things happen. Hearts break. People are captured by other things, but God, capture us by the hope we have in Christ. So I want you to be encouraged, remembering who He is and what He's done. I want you to be encouraged, anticipating and holding on to what He will do in the future. Be encouraged and have hope. He is faithful and He will do it. Thank you, First Thessalonians. He is faithful and He will do it. It will get better. So I'm going to pray for us. Okay? And if you say, and you're here today, you says, you know what? I need some encouragement. I need some hope. I just want you to raise your hand right now. Okay? Raise your hand. Take a take. That's almost everyone. We're going to pray, and you're saying, I need hope today, I need encouragement, and I'm going to pray for you. And some of you may be even outside of Christianity, and you're wondering, the first question we ask, who is this man? I hope today that you're convinced by a short little talk on the one who comes for you. Today could be the day in which your heart is open and you say he is who he says he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came to take away my sin. I'm going to pray for you as well. And if that is you, I want to talk to you today up here. So let's pray. So God, you are here and you see us in this place. You claim us for yourself as prisoners of hope. You've captured us with your love. You've extended your grace and opening the way to your holy mountain. And God, you know every circumstance and every person in this room, even to the very hair on our heads. Father, and you have seen these hands that were upraised today that says, pray for me. God, see me. 
God, I need encouragement. God, I need hope. And God, I ask by your spirit, through your word, that you would infuse every person in this place who is hearing these words with your hope, with your encouragement, with your empowerment. Grant hope to puzzling circumstances. Grab, grant hope to those who are wondering about the future. Grant hope to those who do not know what to do. Grant hope to those who are suffering. You are the God of hope who captures us by your hope. Thank you for calling us into your fortress of hope. And in God, in you we find strength. In you is our shelter. And with you we always have hope. Encourage each one this day. But also for those who have come to recognize who you are, perhaps today for the first time, may there be a commitment and a love for you that would grow and grow and expand and expand that you have forgiven me for my sins. You promised me a hope in the future. You are the righteous redeemer, the hope of all the nations. Jesus, glorify yourself in this place. God, glorify yourself in our lives. God, glorify yourself in this community. God, glorify yourself in the nations of the world. As we say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you, God, that you are righteous, you are holy, you bring salvation, you are gentle. Thank you that you are the king of kings who will give back so much more than what is taken. And we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and we praise you long for you in anticipation of who you are and what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise up to sing together this song. I'm forgiven because you are forsaken. I'm forgiven because you are forsaken. 